the occasion. Uh, Fiona um, Harrison did a PhD at uh, UC Berkeley, working with Steve Khan at the uh, Space Sciences Lab, developing hard X-ray imaging detectors. And right after that, joined Caltech in 1993 as a Millican Fellow. Only recently I learned he was actually a scoundrel, apparently. Uh, anyway, uh, there are a few other Caltech faculty or Milton Fellows here who came the same way. They joined and uh, then later they transmitted to faculty. I think Tom Prince, John Carlstrom, Vikram, myself, and I guess Fiona, maybe I'm missing someone else. Okay, uh, when she came here, uh, she started. <coughs> uh, uh, continued her X-ray, but with the goal of hard X-ray imaging um, at one angstrom photons. It's very hard to get specular reflection. The grazing angles become very, very shallow. So I then need a telescope with a very long length. It becomes not feasible. <coughs> um, so some new techniques have to be developed, mainly multi-layer coating. Uh, she tried some of the, she had a balloon program called HEFT, which was to demonstrate the multi-level technology. The program's also in Europe and Japan for the same purpose. Uh, <clears throat> however, Fiona's program was the first one to go to space. In the mid nineties, there's a lot of uh, uh, ferment and fervor about uh, distance to GRB. Uh, she had a program, I forget its name, maybe Andromeda, to look for GRBs in Andromeda and the halo of Andromeda. But soon thereafter, the GRBs were found to be exogalactic, and Fiona became, I think, she did, that was her first significant, primarily observational work. And <clears throat> she worked with the GRB group, a uh, few faculty members, George, uh, myself, Ryan Sari, and others. Uh, after that, uh, I was, oh, of course, I've been friends with Fiona ever since she came here. So we, I worked with her on a, a SMEX for Bolt and then go through, and then later a context camera for Fermi, La, Fermi Space Telescope, which was also didn't go through. Instead, NASA chose a dog, but you know, that's a separate <laughs> story. Okay, uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, but meanwhile, her long, in nearly 20 year plan of actually bringing together uh, focusing optics and detectors came to fruition in New Star, which was rejected twice, uh, but eventually flew to do nuclear astrophysics. Uh, and this is not a talk on New Star, but she was given the Bethe Prize in recognition of great advance in nuclear astrophysics and the Rossi prize for the ignition itself. She played a big, uh, uh, last, that's so 15 years, played a big role as a leadership role. Uh, she was in fact, led the search committee uh, for a Caltech president, uh, who's now the president. And I wanted to end this, uh, and of course today we'll hear about her leadership role on the national scene that's for 2020. Um, I think in the nine, late 90s, I took Fiona and Dale Quayle to India. Um, and <coughs> there's a celebration in the small town I was born. There's what we name a block of the school. And I have really some amazing pictures of Fiona in <laughs> total Indian garb, the whole parade. Uh, and I just couldn't find them. I don't know where they are. Uh, oh, well, anyway, uh, when I find them, I will circulate to all of you, right? <laughs> okay, sorry for the long introduction, but you know, yours. Okay, thanks. So, you know, I had imagined before uh, this afternoon that uh, everybody had read all 670 pages of the report and would be fully familiar with the content and would mostly spend time with Q&A. But in fact, I went to lunch with the graduate students and they said, well, we don't really know what a decadal survey is anyway. So 
I thought the purpose of this talk really, I think a lot of you probably did hear the rollout and have at least read the introductory material, have an overview of the report. And so I thought the most interesting thing for a colloquium would be to give some background for the students and then to highlight, you know, out of all of the recommendations, there's no way I can do justice to all of it. So I've picked out a few things that I think will be the most influential in the long run. And then I will try to wrap up in time to have plenty of uh, Q&A, because I know my colleagues will want to know, you know, how, what happened to my thing. Um, <laughs> so, whoops. So let's start with what a decadal survey is. If I can, oh, there we go. So these are undertaken by the National Academy of Sciences, which is an independent body, was actually commissioned during the time of Abraham Lincoln to provide advice to the nation uh, on science. And it's now expanded to science, engineering, and medicine. And so the, through the National Academies, every 10 years, the agencies request, whichever agency is requesting the survey, uh, like the task, and ask for a panel uh, to be put together to consider opportunities in science for the next decade, also taking a long-term view, planning for what might come on a 20, 30 year horizon. And then for this uh, report provides a list of prioritized recommendations for government investment in research. Uh, this is now actually required by Congress. So, under the 25 and 28 NASA Authorization Acts, NASA at least, is required to undertake a decadal um, every uh, roughly 10 years. So this was the first decadal survey in the early 60s. Uh, it covered only ground-based astronomy because then of course, space-based astronomy was not yet a thing. And uh, this was a committee, you can see, a small number of people from a few select uh, institutions conducted the whole thing and laid out a plan in the 60s for what uh, the nation, how the nation should invest in ground-based optical astronomy. So this is the 2020 decadal, which I co-chaired together with Rob Kennicutt. And working with Rob, I have to say, was a, a complete pleasure. Um, so from a few people on that central committee and those subcommittees, here's what we have now. We have a main steering committee, then this is gonna go on for pages, I warn you, uh, science panels. Yeah, no, the yes. slides are not advancing on the Zoom page. Oh. I'm not sure why. Okay. I think it's because you're sharing what's, what's shared there is different from what's presented on the screen here. Uh -huh. So maybe we have to share a different screen. Okay. Okay. Is that better? I think so. They'll okay. they'll see this, but That's okay. So anyway, I'm not going to belabor this, but let's just look how many people are involved in the survey. So here we go. So you can see that it involves a very large segment of the community, experts in all areas of science. On the program panels, there are experts in top technology, experts in aerospace engineering, experts in constructing ground-based telescopes. And all of these feed into a main panel, which then synthesizes all of this advice and comes up with a set of rec overarching recommendations. And so these decadal surveys have become extremely influential. And the reason for that is because they're very selective. Lots of things go in, only a few things come out. And so hard choices are made. And the agencies in Congress appreciate this. They think that those things that come through the decadal survey are worthy of the nation's uh, investment. And so they've now actually expanded to Earth, planetary, solar, and space uh, sciences, as well as astronomy and astrophysics. And for the survey, Astro 2020, 
the agencies that are getting this advice are NASA, the National Science Foundation, and the Department of, of Energy. So the, every, the beginning of every survey, the agencies, they write a statement of task. It all goes back and forth. And then they tell you what they want. And I was involved in ASTRO 2010. And the message then was, well, we do really don't want anything new because we don't have any money. And you know, so just sort of go spend some time and come back with something that doesn't cost us any money. This time, actually, in contrast, both the NSF and uh, NASA said, we want an ambitious program. We want you to reach. We want something that motivates us to increase investment in this area of science. And, but they also gave us a budget with a profile. And they said, but don't spend more than this. So with those two sets of advice, we were tasked with putting together a program. And the overall approach we took, right? The, the other thing that you're asked to do in these surveys is to say, well, we can sort of predict a budget, but who knows what could happen? There could be a pandemic or some unexpected thing happens. And so we want advice what to do if budgets change, either upwards or downwards. So our approach was to propose an ambitious program, but for the big things that dominate the budget to give decision rules. If something happens, if technology doesn't progress, if something overruns, here's what we should do. And so we really emphasized phase development for a lot of the projects. Don't start them right away, get, get the scope, get the technologies, get uh, this under your belt and then start them. And then presenting a global strategy, not micromanaging the agencies. And I have to say, we got some initial pushback on this, but uh, we really felt that, look, it's up to the agencies. Here's the vision. We can't tell them uh, how to, you know, find the opportunities. So we just laid out the plan with decision rules and uh, left it to uh, leave it to them with the stewardship of various advisory committees like the CAA and the Board on Physics and Astronomy. So I'm not going to belabor this. This is for the students. I just want to point you. So if you're, this is like 670 pages. Where do I start? Okay. If I were a student, a graduate student, I would say, start with uh, chapter two, which is a synthesis of all the science. It'll give you a very broad picture of the current landscape in astronomy and astrophysics. And if you're interested in something particular, go to the science panel that's relevant, which has a lot more of the details. Uh, read chapter one. That's a summary of the whole report. Um, and then, you know, after that, uh, I would say uh, my favorite chapters are uh, chapter seven and uh, chapter four. So there, if you want to read, that's what I would do. This shows you how we chose to organize the report. So we really felt that we didn't want to emphasize large pro projects over the things that really provide the foundations of the field. We chose not to cross rank, but rather try to look at the function that different programs play in forwarding astronomy and astrophysics. And uh, within those categories provide advice. And so we have a set of programs that really support the people what I would call infrastructure, which is no longer a bad word, by the way. Um, those that really sustain and balance the science by, have, by being able to respond quickly to new discoveries and, and have broad capabilities. Then again, we really emphasize prepare for the future. Okay, don't get ahead of yourself. Prepare for the future and then plan the big things. All, of course, to uh, explore the cosmos. I am not gonna spend time on the science, which is the most important thing. Read chapter two, um, because I have, I have little time and I wanna uh, tell you again, focus on 
the things that I really think are uh, the most important uh, global outcomes that will have the most influence on how uh, we do things in the future. So we had three broad themes that are meant to be all encompassing. Take all the science that the panels put forward and they each put uh, forward a set of questions and a discovery area, distill it into themes. And the three themes are worlds and suns in context, new messengers and new physics and cosmic ecosystems. And again, I'm not gonna go through these, but then we felt it was also necessary to prioritize was in these areas, both to motivate the large projects, the major investments, but also to provide themes, priority areas that are more digestible for uh, say Congress, for example. And so these priority areas are pathways to habitable worlds, new windows on the dynamic universe, and unveiling the drivers of galaxy growth. And again, I, I urge you to, to read the report. Uh, what I'm gonna do for the next, oh, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes, hopefully then leaving a lot of time for discussion, is to try to go through starting with the medium and large size projects and tell you how we approach these and what the challenges we faced were in trying to put together a program. So the first thing that we told the agencies is you have a fabulous program coming up, right? You've got the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, uh, Vera Rubin, and uh, mid scale programs on the ground. You've got a set of fabulous observatories coming up in space, and, and do not, you know, you have to finish these. You have to invest in the science and make it come to fruition before you plan to do new things. So this is a, a snapshot overview of our space program at the large and medium scale. So what does large and medium scale mean? So for NASA, uh, medium is sort of between a few hundred million and say one and a half. Billion. We didn't set, unlike other surveys, we didn't set rigid cost uh, boxes, but that, that's roughly the scale. And then uh, other the large programs are above that. And, but we, we rather, previous surveys have kind of said, okay, here's a cost box, here's number one, two, three, four, five of the things that came to us. Here's a medium cost box, here's number one, two, three, four, five of all the things the community presented to us. And that's not what we did. We said, look, there are different types of programs. There are programs that sustain science, again, that make sure we have new capabilities that come online during the next decade that uh, can be executed in a few, uh, few year to a sub-decade uh, time scale. And uh, there are the enabling uh, things which um, prepare for the future. And then there's the actual large uh, project recommendations. So I'm going to go through this, but what I want to point out is in this enabling and realizing large strategic missions category, we did not take the missions that were presented to us and say, this is number one, this is number two, this is number three, this is number four. Instead, we said, what's important is that we be able to sustain a cadence of large strategic missions. And this requires a new approach. I'm gonna go through that. And only when you're ready should you start them. And then the sustaining programs, again, I'm gonna mention uh, as we uh, go through this. So I wanna go through the story of, you know, how we came to this idea of not having a ranked list of large projects. And the first sort of somewhat obvious point I would say is that, you know, 21st century astrophysics is incredibly rich. It demands panchromatic observations uh, across the spectrum. And if you look at our uh, priority themes that are listed at the top, all of these really require multi-wavelength approach with highly capable uh, facilities. 
And so, you know, that is, uh, I think something that seems obvious now, but I think it's more obvious given history. So for the students, you may not actually have heard of NASA's great observatories, but it's rather amazing that over the period of about 13 years, NASA launched four large strategic missions, or not more, four strategic missions that covered uh, from the infrared all the way to the gamma rays. And they're listed up there, Hubble, Compton, GRO, Chandra, and Spitzer. And this is a remarkable time for astrophysics. If you look at the rate of progress in so many areas, I think it's uh, fair to say that having all these capabilities launched and operating almost simultaneously uh, really advanced the science. But what I want to point you to on the right hand side is the development cost for these inflated to $2020. Okay, so we took what it cost at the time and we inflated it. And you'll see the most expensive mission. Now, this is without service. Okay, so this is a happy launch. Just like that. It was Hubble at 10 billion. But then a whole range of scales down to what we might consider a probe scale today. All right, so this range of different mission sizes is really essential. So what came to us, and I want to emphasize that surveys usually don't make stuff up, right? They take ideas, concepts that are presented to them by the community, and they evaluate them. And maybe they don't adopt them exactly as is. So what came to us? Well, NASA, in the course of preparing for the survey, had, uh, had teams look at a set of four large strategic missions. Uh, LUVOR B, HABEX, 4H, there were many, many different versions of LUVOR and HABEX, by the way, but these are basically large IR optical uh, UV telescopes with very high contrast imaging for uh, the high contrast imaging is for being able to take spectra of the atmospheres of extrasolar planets, and in particular, Earth-like potentially habitable planets um, in reflection, and then also tremendously uh, powerful for general astrophysics. Lens is a high resolution uh, imaging and spectroscopy X-ray uh, mission and origins. Uh, uh, far infrared large strategic missions. And you look at the cost here, all right? They're all at the scale. Well, these are the big scale of the Hubble and James Webb. This is maybe double, okay? So what do you do with that? How do you rank those one, two, three, four, realizing that you need a panchromatic capability, right? To advance the science. And if you tried to launch these sequentially, it would be 80, to 100 years, all right? Because it took 20 years to do James Webb, right? So, you know, that did not seem like a particularly good idea. Um, so, you know, thinking about it, part of the problem here is that if you just say to the community, okay, X-ray community, come up with your you know, biggest vision, IR community, come up with your biggest vision, et cetera, et cetera. That's what you're gonna get, right? Instead, what you need to do is say, okay, um, we need to, to optimize the scale at the range of missions. We really need to set different mission scales and have decadal surveys look at these concept studies, which are very early phase and say, these ones are compelling, but not, you know, this one is not compelling at $10 billion. It's compelling at $3 billion. And we can see a way to de-scope the science and uh, accelerate the launch and still have it be uh, transformational. And so uh, rather than just say, 
okay, do one of these and the other ones can wait 20 years before they start. We said, no, let's look at really investing significant money in co-maturing the missions, all right? And, you know, putting a, you know, up to a billion dollars in this process. And it's not just technology development. I wanna really emphasize it's the mission concept. It's a science, money to go to science teams to say what really are the top priority uh, observations with a target cost in mind, develop it and then have a clear gate before NASA adopts it, okay? So part of what we were trying to avoid is this situation. Okay, this is the Astronomy and Astrophysics in the New Millennium Report, which was the one that had the next generation space telescope, i.e. JWST, as its top priority at $1 billion. Okay, and it was gonna launch within the decade. Okay, it's 2021, and last I checked, December 18th is the launch date, and we're at $11 billion. Okay, so that was very much, uh, in our minds and without uh, going through this in detail, I'll just say that uh, the way this works is you take these early concept studies, they go to the decadal like they did. The decadal says, we like these ones, but not these ones, but we like uh, some of these at a cost scale of three to 5 billion. And there's others that just are the transformational large web scale missions, all right? But uh, given that, then don't just do what happened with web is NASA adopts it and they start spending money and then they realize, whoops, you know, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> and we don't have a handle on the overall architecture. We don't have a handle on the, um, you know, how to implement it, rather do these maturation studies and then have a clear gate, which could be a decadal survey, it could be a mid-decadal review, it could be a separate committee, but anyway, have a gate to say, okay, this is mature enough, its costs are well enough bounded, it does a science, the survey suggested NASA should adopt it, or if it doesn't, then go back to work. So that's the idea behind this restructuring of the way NASA does large missions. And our highest priority for this maturation program is in fact an IROUD large telescope optimized for observing habitable exoplanets and general astrophysics. I'm gonna talk about this in a minute, what this mission is imagined to look like. But then the survey said if co-equal priority are maturing a far infrared spectroscopy for mission, imaging strategic mission and a high spatial and spectral resolution X-ray strategic mission. And we said, no matter what the state of the top thing, you need to start investing mid-decade significantly in these two, because we don't know what's gonna happen. It could be achieving the high contrast imaging is more challenging. It could be, you know, who knows, uh, be, you know, but you have to have the next decadal survey has to have choices. And it can't be, we've only invested in one. So, um, so this large telescope is not actually Louvoir and it's not actually Habex. And it, it's sort of funny to me, actually, <laughs> speaking among friends. You know, Habex did a whole slew of different scales and Louvoir did two different scales. But what we decided in the end was actually what you want is something in between. Uh, and the reason for this is you want something with an aperture that really can uh, detect a robust sample, take spectra of a robust sample of potentially habitable zone planet, exoplanets, and at the same time be the next transformative step for general astrophysics. And we didn't think the largest version of HabX did this, but we thought Louvoir B, the smallest version of Louvoir, and this is a bit, for the students who are probably con confused because you've never heard these acronyms, but never mind. We said, okay, it's, it's really something uh, in between. And so the characteristics generally, so we didn't think the survey was a good place to design a mission. Uh, we just said, look, 
capability uh, that you could get with a about six meter off axis inscribed diameter. So that's your target. Get 10 to the minus 10 contrast. And you know, your target cost is $11 billion. And you should, NASA should push to get it to launch in the first half of the 2040s. If the cost goes way up and the launch date goes way out, well, you know, then that's not the thing you want to do. Uh, so, but why this mission? Well, it's time, right? All the preparatory work of the last decades in, you know, Andrew's work, the work of a lot of people here, finding, characterizing uh, many uh, exoplanets and many in the habitable zone, tests that's finding the nearest ones, the closest in our galaxy, where we can actually uh, make these measurements. The technologies have really advanced, the coronagraph technologies. And so it really is time. And, you know, it is a transformable formational step. It will take a lot of ambition, even, you know, <laughs> uh, some people are quoted in the various newspapers and saying, well, it's not big enough. But, you know, even at the scale, this is ambitious, but it's at the technical forefront and looking internationally, it's at a scale that only NASA can undertake. So I won't talk much about the other two uh, missions. Again, what they look like is really TBD. It's got to be up to the maturation program to decide. They can't be links, which was the big x-ray thing. They can't be origin, which was the big IRI. By our, our IR thing. They have to have selected capabilities, selective instrumentation, and that's part of what the, uh, these studies uh, should figure out. So, in the sustaining uh, category, uh, what we came up with as our top recommendation is to establish a time domain astrophysics program with the realization that with LIGO, uh, with Vera Rubin, uh, you know, it, it really is essential to have certain capabilities in space sustained over the long term. We all know the Swift Observatory is getting old, it won't last forever. And when it goes, there is no hard x ray positioning capability, right? There is no rapid follow up in the x ray. And really, this whole field of time domain requires this. And so, we said, look, but you can probably, it's probably not the best idea to say, we'll just build a mission that has everything on it, the Christmas tree and launch it. We said, well, you know, really put together a group to think hard about what the most important capabilities are, look in the context globally of what other countries are doing, and then select those capabilities that we really need and compete them and probably, this is a suite of missions at the Explorer scale, maybe somewhat larger, but at that scale. And so, uh, so that was our first sustaining mission uh, priority and the top priority. Then we also said, look, there's a huge gap between explorers. So an explorer for the students, there are competed missions like New Star, small explorer like Spherex, the medium sized explorer that Jamie Bach and his uh, team are developing. You know, between that and the multi-billion scale, there's a big gap. And so part of having this sort of great observatories concept is to have smaller, okay, these aren't particularly small, that are billion and a half dollars, but have, you know, uh, missions at the scale launch regularly uh, and, um, regularly means about once a decade. The survey felt they should be strategic in the sense that certain areas should be defined in which to compete them, but the details should be left to you know, the ingenuity community. And so we thought that far IR imaging and or spectroscopy probe is very compelling because if you know, if you, uh, 
know anything about the Spica mission, this was a mission that was jointly pursued by the Japanese and by the Europeans. And it was decided rather abrupt, abruptly in the middle of the survey to, to stop considering it. So this leaves an enormous scientific gap uh, where um, I think a mission of this scale could really have a tremendous impact. And then also with ESA's Athena mission, uh, having complementary capability um, to that is really compelling. So those are the probe scale missions. Now I'm gonna turn to the ground and I wanna leave at least 15 minutes request for discussion. So I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly. So this is a summary of our um, ground-based priorities. So for those of you who don't know what MREFC means, I'll see if I can remember, it's major research, no, research something and facility construction. Equipment, major research equipment and facility construction. Anyway, so this is a, you know, this is a little bit in the weeds, I'm not gonna go into it, but this is how NSF gets the funding from Congress for big things. And so in this category, the top recommendation was investment in the US extremely large telescope uh, program to have significant community access. Uh, next was the cosmic microwave background S4, uh, experiment and then uh, the next generation VLA. We had also in sustaining one sustaining program, and uh, we were advising NSF astronomy, not NSF physics, but we found that there were two programs in physics that really have broad impact for astronomy. So, walking through this relatively quickly, this is an audience I imagine that I don't have to uh, explain what the ELTs are, but you know, when you increase the aperture of the telescope and you operate at the diffraction limit, the power of the telescope goes like the fourth power of the diameter, which means there's an enormous uh, gain as you increase uh, aperture and these telescopes will have an immense range of scientific uh, impact. Essentially, almost every question that came <coughs> to the survey from exoplanet uh, atmospheric spectroscopy to understanding protoplanetary disks, almost everything is addressed uh, by these telescopes. And so there was a proposal that came to the survey to have a united effort between the 30 meter telescope, the giant Magellan telescope, and then Noir Lab, which is a terrible name, but it's basically the NSF lab that coordinates uh, ground-based optical, that together would provide the US community with essential access. So the recommendation's a bit complicated. It's a bit complicated because I think as we all recognize, these are both risky projects. They both have funding gaps to fill. Um, there's a challenge, of course, uh, with the TNT site. But you know, the, the survey really felt the US community must have access. And so the ideal situation would be at least 25% investment in both, but if one of them uh, can't happen for whatever reason, then try to increase the US community access in the other. And I'll just say, I didn't put this view graph in, but we were fairly hard nosed with a set of decision rules and a pretty fast date for um, having the projects close the funding gaps, demonstrate viability, present a management plan. And if they can't do that, then, you know, uh, we felt that really uh, the U.S. investment shouldn't happen. And so that's an example of what I said of decision rules. If costs continue to go up, um, you know, that would uh, basically say, you know, the investment shouldn't happen. Uh, very quickly, 
the cosmic microwave background stage four observatory. This is uh, basically a union of experiments in Chile and at the South Pole that will together uh, make the ma next major step in searching for B mold mode polarization of the cosmic microwave background to find the smoking uh, gun signature of inflation. Um, and uh, the, this is a joint effort between the Department of Energy and NSF at 6040 roughly. It's at a relatively moderate scale, which is still 600 million, but nevertheless. The interesting thing about this uh, project actually is not so, so much just the cosmological uh, measurements, but the fact that at these frequencies, this will survey a lot of the southern sky every day and be a tremendous resource for general astrophysics. So here we really said the cosmologists need to release the data quickly, not of course at the full level of systematics that is required for the B-mode measurements, but this actually is a really powerful time domain facility and will be quite interesting uh, for that. So finally, the, uh, the NGBLA, uh, this is again, another example of a transformative project that you know, it's time to upgrade the JBLA and the BLBA to a modern facility. And again, the range of science questions that such a facility can address is, is very compelling. However, in this particular case, what was presented to the survey was a, a project at the level of $3.2 billion. And, you know, we felt that, look, this is truly a scalable thing. This is an array of antennas, right? It's like the VLA. And you can make choices between, you know, the number, uh, you know, one reason you might want to have the full array is to be able to probe on very fast timescales, but you've got to trade that against the cost and the feasibility. So we said that study needs to be done prototype the antennas, really uh, figure out the correct scope for this. And we did not think it was at the high end. And, and then have a similar process to the uh, Great Observatory's maturation program where you have a review and say, okay, yes, the NSF uh, should start uh, to build this. So very quickly, uh, we also really, uh, strongly endorse the mid-scale program. First, we said it's not, there's not enough investment. It hasn't really uh, funded efforts over the full uh, range that was uh, envisioned. And also, you know, there really ought to be multiple tracks. There ought to be truly open tracks. Then at the somewhat larger scale, strategically identified priorities where uh, we are, um, and then also there should be another track that invites proposals for upgrading instruments on existing telescopes, because that's how you keep those telescopes really at the forefront. And so uh, this was very, very strongly uh, endorsed. And some of the priority areas that I don't list on this slide were uh, radio instrumentation, which would include, for example, uh, wide field radio time domain camera or epic at somewhat smaller scale epic reionization experiments, um, large massively multiplex spec spectrometers on ground-based telescopes and top on the list was a time domain uh, program to mimic what uh, we recommended in space. So, um, I also just want to quickly say we chose, like with the Explorer program, decadal surveys don't get into the business of telling NASA which explorers to select. Open competition is, is a true advantage. And we felt here with mid-scale, we didn't choose any of the many great projects. We said, you know, increase the investment and compete them. So I'm actually, because, uh, I want to really leave 15 minutes for questions and it's 
445. I'll just flash this up and you, we can come back and talk about it if you want. But this survey had for the first time a panel to look at the state of the profession and societal impacts. And uh, chapter three of the report, uh, I recommend reading. It uh, distills a lot of information from one of the panel reports, the state of the profession and societal impacts panel into a series of recommendations aimed at first collecting good demographic data, bridge programs to try to build uh, the pipeline, widen the pipeline of entrance into the field, and then a number of other things that I won't go into, and then uh, bolstering things like grants programs at the NSF, making sure that operations for big facilities don't eat up uh, the grants program, and really uh, supporting early stage technology development. So I'm gonna end now so we can have a discussion. I just wanna say, this is from this morning. So what's my job now that the survey is released? My job is to make sure, and Rob also, to make sure that the agencies understand it and, and embrace it and that Congress and the people who make the funding uh, decisions understand it and embrace it. So this morning we testified to a joint uh, com committee, both the subcommittee on space and aeronautics and the subcommittee on research and technology. And you can see these guys really pay attention. Or... <laughs> no, I was going to take a screenshot. But anyway, um, you know, that's the job now is really trying to explain the excitement. I have to admit, you, you got to go look on the site and read the chairman buyer's uh, testimony. It's very encouraging. He talks about the you know, importance of science, uh, about the great visions in the report, about the need of the nation to invest in this area. And so I think so far, reception uh, you know, on the Hill uh, has been good, but of course there's a lot of work to do. And that's what I'll be spending some of my time when I'm not running the division and trying to do some research, uh, making sure that happens. And so with that, I think let's, uh, we've got 12 minutes left for discussion. And so try to do this as a discussion, by the way, we can go back and forth. Thank you. We'll start first in the room. Questions? Yeah, still on. You mentioned that the guidelines are different from the 2010 site, but you didn't Repeat the question. Yeah, so the question is why were the guidelines, why was the uh, advice given to us by the agencies diff different? Um, yeah, I think it all has to do, some of it has to do with what uh, the landscape was then. Um, you know, James Webb was having a lot of difficulties uh, in NASA, there was a lot of pressure on the budget. And at NSF, I think, um, how to say this politely, uh, you know, you really need visionary leaders at an agency to try to make things happen, all right? So this time around, partly driven at, by the top of the NSF, um, you know, we want to do big things. We want, you know, a healthy MREFC program that does ambitious projects. We want, um, you know, we want to be at the forefront here. And, you know, in the past, NSF has been a bit reactive, right? Give us an idea and we'll think about whether we fund it. So I think in part, you know, it, it just had to do with timing and who was in the leadership position. I would add to that, the 2008 crash had put a definite dent on yes. people's idea of how much money was in the future. Uh, other questions in the room? Yeah. Uh, were there any specific recommendations about the impact of satellite constellations in the upcoming decade? Yeah, so we considered that very uh, carefully, both uh, the satellite constellations, and I'll explain for the students what that is in a minute, 
and uh, the encroachment on radio frequency spectrum, because with the 5G networks, right, uh, it's, it's a little bit scary that ground-based radio astronomy may, you know, 10 years from now have a very decreased bandwidth. So, you know, we had, we actually had a hearing, which is public with Elon Musk about the satellite constellations, which was rather interesting, I must say. Um, and uh, the issue here, for those of you who don't know, is there's this Starlink network of thousands of small uh, communication satellites that are intended to provide internet uh, across the whole globe. And so they launch, I can't remember how many it is in one SpaceX launch, right? It's a whole bunch. And so, you know, there are swarms of these uh, in orbit and the sun glints off of them. So they, and they streak across the sky. So one thing that the Vera Rubin telescope is very worried about, it's mostly a phenomenon that happens at dawn and dusk. You know, if you think about the angles involved, right? But, you know, that means at the beginning and end of the night, you take a wide field image, you're just going to have streaks of satellites. And I think for the survey also was an issue that it's going to change the way we as humans perceive the night sky, right? You don't go out into the desert with your kid or grandkid and say, oh, look, there's Venus. You say, oh, look, there go a bunch of satellites, right? And there are things that can be done to mitigate it. We didn't feel, it's such a rapidly evolving situation. We didn't feel we should recommend do this or do that, but we recommended strongly that a lot of effort that's already uh, being engaged in uh, should continue uh, and accelerate. Okay, let's take a question from the uh, Zoom. Okay, we have a question from Matthew for now. Matthew. Yeah. Hi, Fiona. So um, I think one thing that surprised the uh, astro data science community, particularly with the strong focus on time domain uh, astrophysics, was the, uh, the lack of any support um, for data science specific programs, particularly the computational methodologies and techniques and supporting infrastructures that you're going to need to do these big um, panchromatic observation surveys, time domain surveys. And in terms of mention, um, the field gets about the same shrift as laboratory astrophysics. Um, it seems to be, you know, even early stage technology development is very instrument focused and not in terms of uh, computational data analysis techniques. Now, I know there's mention of it in education, but that's a very different scenario from us developing cutting edge techniques to deal with the big data problems that these things are going to produce. Yeah, so let me address that a bit. Uh, first off, the NSF time domain program, if you read it, is not just instruments. It would include data sciences, it would include event brokers, it would include methods for sifting through Vera Rubin data, all sorts of things. It's meant to be very broad, right? And um, in space, in the time domain, it was envisioned that this working group providing advice on what capabilities would also provide advice to NASA on what data and other infrastructure need is needed to support it. So that addresses the time domain. We did have recommendations related to cross-linking archives on the ground for, with time domain in mind for ready access to uh, many different kinds of data sets. Right, but I would argue that this is the this is the fallacy of the virtual observatory, which was one of the recommendations twenty years ago in the um, decadal report, that you focus too heavily on the data archives, which is all about linking data together, and then there's nothing for what you do when you have all this heterogeneous data. You know, where's the deep learning that we're going to be developing? We're going to be teaching to our students. We're going to get our students to develop that sort of thing. There's no recommendation that NSF or NASA or DOE should be supporting development programs in the same way that they're de supporting development programs for technology, instrumentation, computation should be on an equivalent level, not on a, you know, oh, you've got a data archive and we'll shove a little thing on top of it. Okay. Yeah, Fiona, I'm afraid I agree with that. And, you know, here I am a died in the wool observer instrumentation person. The only three instances of the word broker in this uh, 
and two of them talk of the what is it called that again the more lab brochure explaining where it is well that's not so let me go back to the part of the reason for explicitly saying this investment in time domain needs to include things like mm -hmm. brokers it needs to include investment in com computation it's not instruments right mm -hmm. that's very explicitly in there and there's a you look at the level of investments that we suggest that's a fair bit of money uh, now it is true it's focused on time domain and not millennium simulation and things like that which is is another challenge but are there any questions in the room yeah andrew since it's been a month or so uh, what would you comment on how the agencies are pivoting and especially the, the time scale that you think they'll yeah what's what's kind of interesting is shortly after the survey came out like two weeks later uh, NSF put an announcement saying it was reinstituting its bridge program, which was one of the things we recommended it to. So I think the low hanging fruit, uh, you know, they can implement fast, but I think what's important to understand is there are budget cycles involved for anything invo involving significantly increased funding. Um, you know, that has to go through several budget cycles. But I will say the reception at the agencies was overwhelmingly positive. Um, they have since said, uh, Paul Hertz is publicly on record saying he was thrilled with uh, the vision and is gonna talk at the AAS about how NASA is gonna try to implement it. Um, so that's encouraging. The NSF, as you know, there's new leadership at AST. Um, and so Deborah Fisher, who's taken over, will have to, you know, I think, work on how to implement these things at the NSF. But overall, all the agency responses have been very positive. And then we go. you. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I said that last time the NSF have a very ambitious uh, goal for the potato. But how optimistic are you that Congress will see eye to eye with that? Mm -hmm. Because you guys expect a lot of money on the dynamic which not already. Yeah, so the question is the agencies are responsive, but what about Congress? You know, it's harder to say. Um, there's a lot going on, as you know, right now. But you know, based on the hearing this morning, uh, we heard a lot of, we want to invest, we want to invest in science, we want to invest in, you know, exploring the cosmos, we want to invest in technology. Um, you know, so at least at that level, of course, there are some people from particular states who voice particular interests which always happens but overall you know right now i think there's a positive uh view of the ability to make these things happen that said of course there are midterm elections and all sorts of things and it, it's very hard to know um all we should do as a community in my view is it's time to come together right if your thing isn't in here um, push for what is, uh, try to make it happen. Um, and so far, I think the community has not, I've not seen a lot of divisiveness, which has happened in the past. Um, so, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic, but again, as you say, if there's another 2008, well, you know, Okay, uh, two more qu last two questions. Vikram and then Lynn. Um, what is the challenge process behind defining the science priorities here? Can you say a bit about how you balance just the sheer number of white like, names in different areas versus taking some sort of informed decisions about prioritization? Right. So, uh, you know, there were these science panels, uh, which all of the science white papers, by the way, were read. Um, and those panels uh, took the input from those science white papers and tried to distill it into key questions. What are, out of all of these you know, great ideas, what are the 
questions that really are going to drive the field forward um, in the next decade or two. And then those that was the, those key questions already was a, a big distillation, okay, as well as a discovery area, recognizing that astronomy is a discovery driven science, right? Went to the steering committee for synthesis into the themes that I showed you, which again involved making some choices about what to emphasize. The broad themes tried to be encompassing, the priority areas tried to select the areas that were we felt were going to be the most transformational. Yeah, Lynn, last question. Did uh, the kind of uh, survey committee make any recommendations on the guidelines that you can collaborate collaboration between China and the US, especially for these large projects? We did not. Um, as you know, uh, just listen to the congressional testimony from this morning. That's an extremely hot button issue. Um, and it's really not the decadal's uh, job or position to get in the middle of issues of international relations. All we can do is say that international cooperation is important. We pointed out the things that China is doing that will advance the program and can fill key gaps, but we can't tell you know, the government, um, you know, how to interact. And I would listen to the testimony this morning. It was, I know I'm on the record here on Zoom, but it was a little sobering, I would say. So one of the, one of the recommendations on TNT, I mean, the LT continent will directly have that element of collaboration, right? You're going to face that problem right away. Yes. And, uh, what can the decadal say? Congress, you should not have the attitude that you have towards China. Um, as you know, the infrastructure spending bill was largely a sputnikly born competition with China bill. That's the reality. And one of the questions, it's public, so I can say it, that came up this morning from I think it was Bab, uh, Congressman Babin was, I hear that you're polishing TMT mirrors in China. How can you assure me that that is not going to be used for military purposes in China? So, you know, it's, um, and, and we recommended that the fast radio telescope would be a way with the demise of Arecibo to continue to discover new pulsars. And that got commented on as we refused to rely on a Chinese telescope. Um, so, you know, that's all I'll say, I guess, but. Okay. Uh, the cheaper ways to build fast. Uh, well, it's we didn't. We didn't say build. We said do the NGVLA and and yeah. do your pulsar discovery with increased investment in the GBT and fast is by the way detecting pulsars and all this other stuff. But yeah. Um, okay. Uh, well, we had a good discussion. So let's thank you once more.